Our final presentation uh, this evening is from Hilary Forbes, and Hilary is going to talk about did I'm going to uh, please apologize for my pronunciations. Philicus influences on Aristarchus, a, uh, a consideration of the evidence. Uh, Philicus. <clears throat> Like at 470 to C385 BC, was a Greek pathologian and a, a, a pre circadian philosopher. Philicus discussed a central fire as the center of the universe, and that spheres, in brackets including the sun, close brackets, revolved around it. Scholarship is divided. Uh, is divided as to whether the filiocentric model was based on religious ideas or was a radical new science uh, of his time based on observations and what was known. There is no direct evidence that Aristarchus was influenced by filiocentric universe, yet there's plenty of indirect evidence to suggest he was, including Copernicus's own thinking in his association with um, Starkus, uh, with Philicus. So without further ado, can I please welcome uh, Hilary Forbes. Hilary, over to you, please. Thank you. Uh, I just need to find my screen sharing. I think this is it for some reason. I've got us up twice. Uh, OK, can you all see that? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, OK. Um, OK, just a brief intro then. The reason this came about was because um, I did um, <clears throat> a, a dissertation for an MA in classical studies last year and Aristarchus has long been my astronomical hero because he's the first person who, as far as we know, uh, has came up with a heliocentric, sun-centred uh, model of the universe back 1800 years before Copernicus. And so I decided to do a dissertation on this. And the more I dug into the research about him, the more I came up with some surprising finds. The conventional sort of narrative of Aristarchus is that uh, although he came up with a sun-centered universe, um, that he it was quickly dismissed first by Archimedes and that he was, um, he was, indicted sort of thing, or accused of impiety by a man called Cleanthes um, for putting the sun in the center. And all sorts of things that, that came together that people, the narrative that's grown up around this, and this is common um, even in astronomical circles um, today, uh, I discovered to be incorrect, or at least for the weight of evidence to be completely the opposite. And so I did this dissertation and um, then uh, mentioned it to Gerard, who then asked if I might give a talk on the 12th of March, which I did. Only I didn't quite get everything in on that talk. And this is the bit that I didn't, I wasn't able to cover because there just wasn't time. So the very, int one, very interesting aspect of Aristarchus was Philolaus the Pythagorean. And whether Aristarchus was influenced in his heliocentric model of the universe by Philolaus. And Philolaus is a fascinating character. There's a whole book being written out about him, uh, which at some point I intend to, to buy, but um, it's quite expensive, but it will be well worth it. And it's been written by a man called Carl Huffman. Um, so just to, to illustrate this, um, this is the common sort of knowledge, if you like, this is the, what we're all used to seeing. Um, Aristotle's universe with the, and everybody else's universe, Ptolemy, you know, Ptolemy, all these people, um, that had the earth as the center, our geocentric universe with everything going around the earth. And then we're used to seeing Copernicus's universe with everything going around the sun. But there was another universe, if you like, and this was Philolaus's pyrocentric universe. And this was a model of the universe that a man, this man called Philolaus of Croton came up with 
about 100 years after Pythagoras and about 100 years before Aristarchus. And what he did was he put a central fire, a sort of hearth of the gods, right in the middle instead of the earth. And this was radical because he shifted the earth and he put the earth in motion. Not only did he do that, but he also shifted all the planets. Instead of going around earth, they went around this central fire. And not only that, but he made the sun go round it as well. So this talk isn't about why he did that, although I will stop and ponder occasionally about this. It is whether or not Aristarchus was influenced by this. Because for Aristarchus to have come up with a heliocentric model, and theories don't really just come out of nowhere. They, they evolve. They sometimes have other theories before them. And, you know, this is how science goes, isn't it? And so this is really about can we figure out whether he was influenced by Philolaeus? Was Philolaeus the first to put the Earth in orbit, even though it wasn't around the sun? And so who was this guy, Philolaeus of Croton? He was a Pythagorean. He lived around uh, 470 BC to 385 BC. And so he was likely to, he died probably just around the time that Aristotle was born. He might, however, have met Plato. Um, there are a number of fragments of writing which are attributed to Philolaeus. Uh, and in these fragments, he proposed that the earth and, and planets were in orbit around a central fire. So let's have a look at what he said. This is, uh, these are English translations of, um, of the, the ancient Greek. Um, so he said that, you know, the one in the middle of the sphere uh, is called hearth, um, Hestia. And another bit about him where we read that fire is in the middle, but this is the hearth of the whole. Um, so the language is, is difficult, um, even more so in ancient Greece. Uh, and in second place, the counter earth. I shall say a bit about the counter earth in a minute. In third, the earth we inhabit, which lives and revolves opposite to the counter earth. And so for this reason, the people in that one are not being seen by the ones in this one. What on earth is the counter earth? So I'm gonna go back to our diagram. So the counter earth was another earth that runs parallel to earth around this central half. And the reason that we couldn't see it or we can't see it is because we live on this side of the earth, the side that faces out towards the stars. And we never uh, can see this counter earth. Now, whether this indicates that Philolaeus didn't think that Earth revolved on its own axis is another story. However, he then he, he introduced this idea of a counter Earth and he decided that there were people like us on this counter Earth. Why did he come up with this? One possibility was because uh, the number 10 was very important to Pythagoreans and it was quite a sacred number. And so if we count up the sun and the earth and the counter earth and the moon, that makes four. If we then add in the five planets, the five known planets at the time, that makes nine. And then the, the fixed stars is just one whole thing, despite the fact that we now know there were a kind of several trillion of them and galaxies and so on. Um, but that was what he decided. So whether that was the reason or not, we don't really know. But there is also controversy over where, where the... It, these fragments where Philolaeus, Philolaeus devises this model uh, are authentic or whether they were forgeries written in Aristotle's time or, or after Aristotle, that's also still up for debate. However, uh, there are plenty of people who, who really believe that it was Philolaeus and, and have produced evidence really to say that it was. So he was a philosopher, and this is a little bit of summary of that bit. Uh, the other bit that's that's debated is whether his what what is called a pyrocentric model, uh, with this fire in the middle, pyro sort of comes from the Greek for fire, was based on religious ideas or based on some kind of new science of his time, based on observations and what was known. Which is, after all, what happens where we're all at. We can only what we observe. We make assumptions on what we observe. We create mathematical models. Was this one of those? or was religion involved? 
There's no actual direct evidence that Aristarchus of Samos was influenced by Philolaeus's pyrocentric universe, because we don't read anything that Aristarchus said that suggests that, other than the fact that he came up with this model. But there is indirect evidence, including what Copernicus said. So the question, was he influenced? I argue that he was. Huffman, who's written this amazing book, has commented, he says, Philolaeus's decision to posit an unobserved and unobservable central fire in the middle of the cosmos is one of the most puzzling moments in Greek cosmology. And he goes on to suggest that from this time, the understanding of Earth as a planet in the cosmos was forever changed. In spite of all the continued geocentric theory that seemed, as far as we know, to be the most common theory. However, I think we might start to question that. So questions to ask, did Aristarchus include the five planets in his model? And we're going to look at evidence for and against. Because if he did, if we find that he did include those five planets, that's and those five planets go around the sun uh, in Aristarchus's model, and that would be indirect evidence to suggest that in fact he did and was influenced by Philolaeus. Copernicus' comparison or association of Aristarchus with Philolaeus. How much did Copernicus know about Aristarchus? And then finally, what would be the significance if it turned out Philolaeus wasn't actually the author of those fragments that built that pyrocentric model of the universe? First of all, then, did Aristarchus include the five planets? There is no reference, interestingly, or mention of the five planets in Archimedes' sand reckoner, which is the main source we have for Aristarchus's model of this sun-centered universe. There is no mention of the five planets in the only extant work we have of Aristarchus, which is called On the Sizes and Distances of the Sun and Earth. Is therefore that old question, absence of evidence, evidence of absence. However, there is a mention of Aristarchus in relation to the retrograde movement of the planets. But does this mean that he thought the planets were orbiting the sun? or the Earth as the Earth orbited the Sun. So did it conclude? What is, Carmen is a scholar, uh, Christian Carmen, and he uses, and references are at the end, so there's a slide with references on. Uh, Carmen uses this fact that um, Aristarchus never mentions the five known planets, and he uses that against Aristarchus, including them. He also argues that Aristarchus not using or including those five planets is a reason why, in Carmen's argument, Aristarchus was therefore dismissed very quickly, as the conventional narrative would say. So it's a bit of a tricky argument, this, because there's assumptions in assumptions. Carmen says that the pre-Copernican heliocentrism was essentially different from the Copernican heliocentrism in such a way that the advantages of Copernicus's heliocentrism can only be attributed to including the five planets. But he argues that Aristarchus was not like Copernicus's system because it didn't include the five planets. So it's a bit of a funny argument because he says, he goes on the fact that Aristarchus didn't mention the five planets to say that therefore he probably didn't include them. And then he goes on that to say, and this is why Aristarchus's theory didn't really take root. But I would argue that in fact, there are reasons for all of those things. First of all, although there's, Carmen does concede that although there is no reference to those five planets by Aristarchus anywhere, nor in Archimedes Sand Reckoner, that that doesn't necessarily mean that he didn't include them. He also holds the view, uh, as I've said, that this argument is that he thinks, well, but it probably he probably didn't include them because that's why his theory didn't take root and why it didn't succeed the Earth centered universe. But I would argue the opposite. 
I would argue that there was no reference to the planets, probably because there was no need to refer to them. Because the whole point of Aristarchus coming up with this theory was likely to have been to explain the retrograde motion of the planets. He'd also figured out, Aristarchus, in his extant work, that either came just before or just after at the same time as his heliocentric theory, that the sun was a lot bigger than Earth and a lot further, a, a lot bigger than the moon and was a lot further away than the moon. And he goes, does, this is quite a work that he does there. And so he might have included that to say, well, how sensible is it that something that is much bigger than the Earth should be at the centre of the universe? But he would have really based his, his system on what was called saving the phenomena, which is a, the ancient Greek way of saying, um, explaining the retrograde movement of the planets. As well as all that, uh, Copernicus associates Aristarchus with Philolaus. And he talks about them in the same sentence, which we'll see a little bit later. A key text for this, is this one. And this is uh, Plutarch in his works called Moralia, uh, talking about um, Plato's Timaeus. So an ancient Greek talking about an even more ancient Greek. Um, and in Plato's works Timaeus, uh, he also talks about the, the motions of the earth and the planets. And Plutarch says, what does Timaeus mean? was he giving the earth motion like that of the sun and moon and the five planets, which because they reverse their courses, he called instruments of time. In other words, he's talking here about the retrograde motion movements of the planets. And then he compares it uh, a little bit further on. Uh, he said, you know, do, does this, it, can this be understood to have been devised not as confined and as at rest, but as turning and whirling about in the way set forth by Aristarchus and Seleucus, by the former only as a hypothesis, but by Seleucus beyond that as a statement of fact. Most interesting little sentence there about this Chaldean astronomer called Selyu Seleucus, Seleucus, I don't know how you pronounce half of these words, um, but Seleucus actually did say that he had definitely sort of proved, if you like, shown that Aristarchus was correct. And he lived about 100 years after Aristarchus. And that is one very good bit of evidence to say that Aristarchus was not dismissed, actually, very quickly. And we'll also see that um, it, you know, Carmen's argument that he was dismissed quickly doesn't hold up uh, because of this. Also because the oldest manuscript, which talks about um, the conventional narrative, which suggests that, in fact, Aristarchus was accused of impiety for putting the sun at the centre, uh, is actually the other way around. In the oldest manuscript we have that Plutarch wrote uh, about seeing the face in the uh, seeing a, a face in the orb of the moon, it, it was a is an interesting uh, sort of work of Plutarch when he. He talks about what our equivalent today would be the man in the moon. And there's a whole work about this. It's very fascinating. Uh, and in fact, it looks as if Cleanthes was being accused by Aristarchus of impiety, possibly because Cleanthes was really about sort of sun worship in many ways. And Aristarchus may have been saying, you put the sun in, in you know, in orbit around the earth and yet you worship the sun. And he was perhaps being ironic. So we can dig into this quite a lot, um, but perhaps the strongest evidence that this theory of Aristarchus was not dismissed came from the Sand Reckoner and Archimedes himself, who in all his works only ever mentions people he promotes. And Aristarchus was the most mentioned person in any of Archimedes' works. He may have slightly tried to correct Aristarchus's idea but he certainly didn't dismiss him, as the conventional narrative says. And so in all of those points, we can see that the evidence outweighs this conventional narrative that Aristarchus was easily dismissed. And that, in fact, he was still being that theory was being upheld for a long time. How that eventually 
uh, sort of perhaps not uh, disappeared totally because it was still being talked about in Copernicus's day, but Ptolemy and Hipparchus uh, really um, held sway with the geocentric theory in the end. But a long time later, and, and who knows that who, through that time, and of course there are over 1800 years, there are periods of that time where, where the, hist the history is not well documented. So Aristarchus including the five planets can't be dismissed very easily. Neither can it be totally confirmed, but I would say that the weight of evidence goes with him including those five planets, which would indicate and suggest that he was influenced by Philolaus of Croton. And here's just a reminder of Philolaus's uh, model. And another thing, you can see lots of interpretations and no one image I have found is exactly the same um, if you have a look at this. So another key text, Owen Gingrich, and he is an amazing historian, an astrophysics historian and an astrophysicist. And he's quoting Copernicus here. And he said, if we should admit that the motion of the sun and moon could be demonstrated, even if Earth is fixed, then with respect to other wandering bodies, there is less agreement. And Copernicus goes on here to, it says, Philolaus believed in the mobility of the Earth. And some say Aristarchus of Samos was of that opinion. So this is Gingerish quoting Copernicus. And these lines, so you can see Copernicus here actually associates Aristarchus and almost uses Aristarchus to reinforce Philolaus' idea of the mobility of the earth. And so was Copernicus familiar with Aristarchus's heliocentric proposal? Now Gingrich argues that perhaps Copernicus was not familiar in all the details of it, and he may not have been, of course, and Gingrich is probably the expert in this kind of field of Copernicus. Uh, he's written a brilliant book called um, The Book That Nobody Read, which is really worth reading. Um, it's unputdownable, so make sure you've got several days to do it. Uh, but in a way, I think by Copernicus saying some say that Aristarchus means that Copernicus had obviously heard of him, and he's going on hearsay that what other people have said. But he's using that hearsay to, to reinforce uh, Philolaus' moving the, you know, putting the mobility of the earth and putting it around, in Philolaus's case, the central fire, but in Aristarchus's case, the sun. So Aristarchus replaced the Philolaus's central fire with the sun. Why he did that is another story. Um, Interestingly, those lines that, I, that we read just a minute ago were in only in Copernicus's personal copy of his huge uh, work, De Revolutionibus. Um, and then they were, they were taken out. And that's uh, the subject of, of a, a long article that Owen Gingrich actually uh, wrote, which is fascinating in itself. Um, so other opinions. So Copernicus had ready access to this um, in the 15th century. So you can just read some of these here. Um, some of them are very unpronounceable, uh, but it seems clear from this that Copernicus did have access to knowing either through others, through the hearsay of others, or through reading himself about Aristarchus's heliocentric theory. Um, and so 1500 years later, he was still being discussed. That's not a theory that died, is it really? That's a theory that somewhere along the line was continually discussed uh, along with the geocentric universe. Uh, so for Copernicus, what's very interesting, um, he says that Aristarchus was of the same opinion as Philolaus, and yet he was not. Aristarchus placed the sun in the centre, and of course, Philolaus placed a central fire in the centre. So that's a very interesting uh, topic to research, really. And I did come up with some answers about that, uh, which I haven't got time to go into here. Copernicus as well, uh, some suggest, was a Pythagorean. 
And so he viewed Philolaus and the Pythagoreans' mathematics uh, and ideas as sacred, which may have been partly why he didn't want to publish his own work, because he, he didn't want to put it into the public knowledge because he felt it was too sacred for that. Possibly that's one suggestion. The idea there of the central fire may not have been relevant to Copernicus, but the brilliance of setting the Earth in orbit was. So Thomas Heath has wrote, written a fairly definitive work about Aristarchus of Samos called the Ancient Copernicus. And he is of no doubt whatsoever that the five planets were included in Aristarchus's sun-centered universe. And he doesn't question it anywhere in his book. And in fact, he wouldn't really have given that title to Aristarchus had he not believed it was the same as Copernicus. So the summary then of the key points, Aristarchus, uh, Phyllis Laius set, set the earth in motion and so did Aristarchus. Aristarchus likely included the five planets, the other five planets as did Philolaeus, but this is arguable, but I would argue that he likely, he probably did. Aristarchus replaced the central half of the gods with the sun for reasons that are not absolutely clear, but we can have some ideas about that Copernicus associated Aristarchus with Philolaeus in putting the earth in orbit. If the fragments associated and attributed to Philolaeus were later forgeries, then actually it simply means Aristarchus was the first to place the earth into orbit rather than Philolaeus, or perhaps somebody else did, but Aristarchus was influenced by that anyway. So what we have is two questions. If Aristarchus was influenced by Philolaeus, for what reason did he remove the central fire and replace it with the sun? And to return to the earlier quote, where Huffman comments, Philolaeus's decision to posit an unobserved and unobservable central fire in the middle of the cosmos is one of the most puzzling moments in early Greek cosmology. And according to Huffman, it changed the way we see our universe forever. What made Philolaeus set the earth in motion around a central half? There's a question that nobody's really found an answer to, and it's an area of very, very fascinating research. These are my references, and I am in the middle of attempting to write up my talk from the 12th of March and uh, basically into uh, quite a long article for the antiquarian astronomer for next year. This is my task in July. So um, the talk that I did on the 12th of March will be all included in there um, as well in summary form. Okay, thank you for listening and to one of my favorite subjects and uh, I'm going to end it there. And I'm going to stop the screen share there. Thank you, Hilary. Absolutely wonderful as always. Thank you. Looking forward to the paper in the AA next year. Thank you. Hopefully that part will also be included. Thank uh, you. I'm sure there's some questions from people. Uh, this is a, a very fascinating part of Greek history, this argument about, uh, you know, uh, where they got their ideas from about the earth and the sun at the centre of the uh, Yes. Questions, please, anybody. Um, there isn't anything from the chat. You know, the um, a couple from? of questions. The, I noticed the moon is separated from the Earth, so there was no real understanding that the moon was orbiting the Earth at that time at all. Um, I, I well, I, I must must be the case. Well, that's a really interesting point because uh, certainly in. Well, in, in the Paris, in Philolaeus's universe, it did sort of orbit the Earth, but not in the way it really just like one of the other planets. Um, uh, sorry, no, the moon orbited the sun. That's right. No, you're right there. It was Aristarchus who put the moon in orbit around the Earth um, in his extant text called On Sizes and Distances uh, of the Sun and Moon. And he's got an extensive work with that uh, that has come down to us in which Thomas Heath in his book um, goes into uh, in some detail with the diagrams as well. Um, yeah, really, really interesting. 
Yeah, and the other the other thing, the the counter earth, I find fascinating. And your yes. explanation was it was the it adds up to the magic number ten. Yes, yes. Is that I the, mean, that, the only reason for that? Do you think? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's the that's one reason, and that could have been the only reason. But it, there could have been other reasons. But mm. you know, they they were very numbers were very sacred, weren't they, to the Pythagoreans? And I still there's an awful lot I still don't know about the Pythagoreans. Um, you know, my my venture into into ancient astronomy is still really in its infancy uh and you know i've i'm always fascinated by there's just so much to learn isn't there and and i didn't even know pythagoras uh, that copernicus was a pythagorean that that has been suggested uh so that's another slant on his reluctance his possible reluctance to produce his his great work um which i i didn't know until i started writing this dissertation so there's so much to learn and I'm sure that, you know, there may be people here uh, when I gave my talk on the 12th of March, somebody came up to me and told me something else that I didn't know. And I thought, oh, I wish you'd tell me that before the talk. I could have included it, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's a fascinating topic. Thank you. OK, thanks, John. Uh, Benny, yes. Well, great presentation. Thank you very much, Hillary. No, oh, thank you. Question, sort, sort of a directional and um, you're you're rewriting the history of the universe in a sense well, well, a sol our solar system i'm rewriting the narrative of okay. aristarchus that's a different thing isn't it okay that's like how does it you've uh, you've been in um, conferences and symposiums and things like that um what has been the reception and how have you discussed how have you responded to the reception? Well, um, I haven't actually been in the only the first because I did my dissertation last year. Uh, mm. I discovered Aristarchus in a footnote. Uh, I taught astronomy GCSE for 13 years and I've taught maths mm. for 20 odd, 25 years. And uh, I discovered Aristarchus in a book about Copernicus and it was in a footnote. Mm. And I haven't heard of him before. This is going back well, years and years over a decade. Mm. And I started reading about him and I thought, why, why am I not reading about Aristarchus anywhere else? And slowly but surely, he has finally made his way into the GCSE astronomy curriculum, but incorrectly, as it happens, uh, perhaps not incorrectly, but confusedly. Um, he's sort of associated with Eratosthenes um, in a way that is difficult to separate. And yet we don't even know, you know, and, and the heliocentric. Uh, model of Aristarchus is not included in the GCSE. So there's some confusion. I've even found uh, authors who have written in books, I'm, I've got to be careful because this is recorded, but and I don't want to embarrass anybody, but there have books that have been read um, by NASA scientists that have been written um, that actually have based their whatever they've said about him on no evidence whatsoever. And I've contacted them and they've said, oh, that was ages ago. I can't remember. Um, and so I found that what happens is narratives pick up steam, don't they? They somebody says something, an astronomer says something about Aristarchus. And then that person is then assumed to know everything. And if they happen to be a NASA scientist, nobody argues with a NASA scientist. Um, and so I've unpicked so much of the narrative to think just a minute actually why why are people saying this when actually the evidence says something different so uh the the talk i gave on the 12th of march was really my first uh, foray into <laughs> my my version of arist of the narrative of aristarchus uh and this is the second one and so you know that there's a lot there's a long way to go and people are interested uh to hear this because actually a lot of people haven't even heard of him knew that he might have come up with the sun scent of universe but don't really know in what sense that was and what was you know was it dismissed and why aren't we hearing about it so even though people might have heard his name and astronomers know his name in general they maybe don't really know very much about him because it's not talked about very much it's talked about as a sort of you know ancient greek astronomers it's as if they they're from somewhere in i don't know um in Middle Earth, you know, and they're not really relevant to today. Very often that's how they're talked about. Um, a bit like Gandalf. 
<laughs> some ancient sort of astronomer, but that, well, they're not really relevant today, but they are very mm. relevant because how we understand the narratives that have come down to us uh, builds up our history, doesn't it, of cosmology and astronomy. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important that we understand history, but I could talk about this forever. So mm. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being interested. Um, I've got a comment uh, on the chat from Bill Barton. Uh, mm. He says the counter earth reemerged in the 19th century, it's from memory, and had to be quashed by Patrick Moore saying we orbit in an ecliptic orbit, <laughs> or we should be able to see it uh, once in a while. Sorry, I didn't quite catch all of that. Um, um, let I'll me look at the again. chat. Um, more, more a comment. Uh, the counter Earth, yes, in the 1970s from memory in brackets, right, and had to be quashed by Patrick Moore saying we orbit in an ecliptic orbit, so we should be able to see it, yes, once in a while. Yes, well, that's true, of course. I mean, I don't know for how long this counter Earth was believed or thought to be there, and that's another another bit of reading I need to do, but thank you, yes. Yeah, Patrick Moore was brilliant. I love Patrick Moore. He he was a great, you know, uh, a great man. So thank you for that. Yeah. 